Hi everyone, today let's talk about visual impairments, abbreviated as VI. During today's presentation, we will talk about the definition, characteristics and identification, causes, prevalence, educational considerations, and transition for visual impairments. Let's start with the definition. So there's two definitions. We have the legal definition. For legally blind, a person sees at 2200 or less with correction, meaning with glasses or eye surgery. And their field of vision is less than 20 degrees. For low vision, a person sees between 2070 and 2200 with correction. Moving on to the educational definition, that's the ability to function using the available sight. So when a child is blind, they must learn to read with braille. And if they have low vision, they can read some print or large or magnified text. Now it's important to know that most people who are blind can actually see. Let's look at a few characteristics. Let's take a look at this vision chart. So earlier I was talking about a person who's legally blind has vision of 20 or 200 or less. That probably didn't make any sense. But looking at this chart, we see 20 of 200, which show that the person who is legally blind would barely be able to see this large E from 20 feet away with corrected vision, which means they're wearing glasses or they've had eye surgery. To legally have low vision, a person would see from 2070 or less with corrected vision. So that is this line here with TOZ. Now a person who has 2020 vision is right here at the green line. So those of you who do not need glasses for anything, you are blessed and you can see these little letters that say D-E-F-P-O-T-E-C without any glasses or eye surgery. So let's have a quick look at a person who sees at 2200 or less. This is how they would see this Snelling chart from 20 feet away during an eye test. Now the definition also talked about 20 degrees of vision. So what does that mean? Well, first let's get rid of all of these little marks on here. So if a person sees at 20 degrees of vision, you'll see this man here. And the 20 degrees of vision is this yellow area. Now the yellow area, is the field of vision that that person would have. If you're sitting here at the computer or watching on your phone and you look straight ahead, put your arms straight out in front of you. Now move your arms out to the side so that they're in a straight line on the right and the left side of you. If you're still looking ahead, you can probably still see your arms or if you wiggle your fingers, you'll be able to see your fingers. That means you're able to see in this green area, which is also peripheral vision. A person who is legally blind would not be able to see the green or the blue. They only see this 20 degrees right here in front of them. Another way to look at 20 degrees is to hold your two, your two hands together, and that's about the, the, the angle of vision that a person would be able to see who is legally blind. Let's take a small look at color deficiency. A lot of us call this being colorblind. Now a person who has normal color vision would see this picture here with all of the different colored colored pencils. A person who has red blind color deficiency, notice that the red colors from all of the different colored pencils has been eliminated or erased from that person's vision. Now if we look at green blind, you'll see that the green hues have disappeared as well as the red. It's important to note that in the color spectrum, the red and the greens overlap, which is why a person who has red blindness or green blindness have the same type of range of vision when it comes to colors. Next, we have blue blind. Now here you'll see the deep concentrations of blues have been eliminated, so they would see the world in this way. Now this blue blind is actually very rare, and there's also black and white where they see no colors at all and they are truly colorblind in that they truly see like on an old school black and white television. 
What's interesting to know is that there, a normal person sees a million shades of color. And so anytime a person has a deficit in colors, they're seeing less colors than someone else. When a person has color deficiency, they actually see about five to 10% of those one million shades that a person with normal color vision would see. When a person has a color deficiency, some colors look the same. So we have red, green, yellow, orange, brown would all look similar to a person with a color deficiency. As well as blue and purple could look similar. Pink may look gray and white and green or beige and green may also be very similar to each other. So here we're going to show an example of the Ishi Ish Ishihara test, which is also a test for color blindness. Now, if you look here in the, the first box, you'll see that this is a person with normal vision and you'll see red, yellow, orange, green, and maybe slightly blue little dots. Now, the number in this circle is a seven. And if you do not have a color deficiency, you're able to see the green seven in the middle. If we move over to the red color blindness, you notice the seven completely disappears as well as all of the red hues from the circles. Looking at the green color blindness, you'll see that there's a little more red hue to the circles, but the red and greens have still disappeared from the circles. Now here, this is a color deficiency, meaning it's weak in color tones, but they're not quite color blind. So you'll notice that here again, we have the normal circle with the seven in the middle and green. And here on the red, you can slightly see the seven in the middle, but the red hues around that green seven have completely disappeared where the reds look brown. Then over here, we have the weak green blindness or green deficiency. So you slightly see a little bit of green and we still have that red hue, but the colors are not as vibrant as they are for a person with normal color vision. Moving on to the identification. So let's first look at a few red flags that you can look for if a person may have a visual impairment or a color deficiency. So for a visual impairment, you may want to look for the alignment of a person's eyes. You can look at, look for red eyelids or watery red eyes. You may also notice that a child or a person rubs their eyes. Maybe they close or cover one eye when they're looking at something. They may tilt their head or move forward to get closer to something that has written words or details in the pictures. Maybe they have trouble with reading or any work that's close to their face. Maybe they hold things really close when they're trying to read or figure out what's in the picture. The person may blink a lot or they might seem cranky anytime you ask them to do something that requires them to use their eyes up close. Things may be blurry or hard to see for this person and we all know that they may squint their eyes or frown when they're trying to see to make the vision more clear. Children when they're young they may not realize that they're having a visual impairment or trouble with their vision so they may seem, say things like my eyes are itchy or I can't see very well. Maybe they say I see blurry or I see double, I see two. And if you give them work that's up close, they might feel dizzy, sick, or nauseous from reading and trying to see what's going on. And the vision may seem blurry or double or may make them feel like they're spinning, which can cause the sick, nauseous, or dizzy feeling. Now, people with vision impairments may also have difficulty recognizing a familiar face. Now, this is definitely a red flag for low vision. They may also have reading difficulties or difficulty seeing objects and obstacles, meaning like curbs on the street or stairs. This is also signs for a low vision impairment. And then for color deficiency, there may be color or color name confusion. There could be difficulty with traffic signs, especially if they have red or green blindness, since that red symbol at the top tells everyone to stop they may not be able to see that that is red. So they have to learn other ways of differentiating the different traffic signs. And they could have difficulty matching socks. 
because remember the different colors look the same to them. So color testing is accurate as of the age of four and the child may appear as an underperformer, but it could actually be a visual impairment. So when we're identifying visual impairments, we're coming back to this Snellen chart. Now notice there's very different forms of the Snellen chart, depending on the age of the child or perhaps their language. There can also be several other varieties of this chart. And along with the chart, there are other tests that can also check for any um, eye diseases or other types of visual impairments. Now let's move on to the causes. Now I'll tell you a little secret up front. Crossing your eyes, such as the picture right here on the right, is not a cause of a visual impairment and your eyes will not be stuck like this. I know we were all told that as children, but that is not a cause for a visual impairment. For visual impairments include genetics. There could also be issues with eye structures. There could be disease exposure during pregnancy, such as measles, premature birth, nutritional deficits, such as a vitamin A deficiency, damage to the eye structures, disease, such as glaucoma, cataracts, brain tumors, or even eye muscle issues. On children, some of the causes of visual impairments include cortical visual impairment, which is damage to parts of the brain and the leading cause of blindness in children. There's also retinopathy of prematurity. This is an abnormal growth of blood vessels in the eye, and it's important to monitor oxygen given to premature babies. Next, we have optic nerve hypoplasia. This is an underdevelopment of the optic nerve and is usually accompanied by other disorders. Of course, there can always be hereditary factors such as retinous pigmentosa. This can include tunnel vision and night blindness. And finally, we have improper muscle functioning. This can include strab strabismus, which is when one or both eyes are directed inward, and the brain will reject signals from the deviating eye or eyes. Next is the nystagmus, and this is rapid involuntary eye movement. deficiencies can include genetics, they can be acquired such as damage to the brain or to the retina areas. This can be caused by shaken baby syndrome or other causes of brain swelling. We have diseases such as diabetes that can cause color deficiency, various drugs, nutritional deficits such as of deficiency in vitamin A, and also chemicals such as carbon monoxide and lead. Let's take a look at how often visual impairments occur. For children ages 6 to 21 years old, only about 0.04% have a visual impairment. But this is 10 times more likely in adults. So visual impairments are actually one of the least prevalent disabilities in children. color deficiency, girls have about a 1 in 200 chance of having a, some sort of a color deficiency, while boys have a 1 in 12 chance of a red-green deficiency and a 1 in 4 chance of any type of deficiency of color. Taking a look at some educational considerations. orientation when working with students who have visual impairments. You may want to show how to use the long cane, a guide dog, tactile maps, or even human guides. Questions that can be used for students with visual impairments include braille, large print books, magnifying devices, shortened assignments, additional time, cooperative learning, readers or note takers, and a parallel curriculum. Braille is a very interesting system that revolves around six dots. 
These six dots are put into various codes to form the letters and numbers that those without visual impairment see in written text. There's special keyboards and typewriters that can print Braille, and it's important to teach students who have severe or limited vision how to use Braille and the various systems for creating written products in Braille. In Braille. It's also important to teach phonics when teaching Braille just as you would with a child who does not have a visual impairment. The next important step is transition. Every video before this one for disabilities, early intervention is very important. We want to make sure that we have orientation and mobility training as soon as possible so that the student is able to move around various locations as independently as possible. We also want to facilitate interactions with sighted children. We want to make sure children are included and we want to have them integrated into the mainstream classroom as much as possible. Parent involvement and advocacy is also key so we want to make sure we supply parents with information to support their child at home. We want to make sure that we focus on independent living. Make sure that you instruct children with disabilities and especially visual impairments how to cross streets safely. There's several accessible pedestrian signals that make, sig that make noises so that the person with a visual impairment is able to know when it's their turn to cross the street. Sometimes there's also raised dome detection warnings to help a person using the walking cane know that a barrier is approaching. We also want to make sure that we focus on employment. Underemployment is very common for people with visual impairments and a lot of times those with visual impairments are overqualified for the positions that they are able to obtain. So we want to make sure that they're placed in a job, they're qualified for, and that they get a job, and we also want to make sure those jobs provide adequate accommodations. Thank you for watching this visual video on visual impairments, abbreviated as VI.